This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of November 9th, 2020. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Dukes Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we break down the election results so far and take a stab at what we think they mean going forward for fiscal policy. Second, we dive into the two core issues surrounding the permanent fund. Why some want to divide them, but why we think that's not only bad policy, but ultimately not likely. And third, we take a first look at what a Biden presidency will mean for Alaska oil. And now let's join Michael. This is kind of the post-election edition of the the program here. So we're going to start off with uh, what is uh, what is Governor Dunleavy? You know, what does he have in store for him? Did he get his uh, magic ratio? Did he get the twenty-one? Did he get the sixteen? Where you know where is he at? Let's talk a little bit about that. Well, as we've discussed on the show through the through this election cycle, there's two numbers that that I've looked at uh, to to see where the legislature has been landing. One is sixteen. Does he have sixteen that would back him up? On, uh, on deep uh, vetoes, deep spending cuts, um, uh, if it came down to having to do those through vetoes. Uh, and that 16 can be, you can aggregate it in any way you want, either from the House or from the Senate. It doesn't need to be divided between the two bodies. It just needs to be 16 uh, in the legislature total to, to back him up. And then another, a second number that, that, that we've talked about on the show is 21 plus 11. Does he have 21 in the House? To, to, to pass legislation and 11 in the Senate uh, to, to pass legislation. The, the importance of the 21 plus 11 is on things like the PFD uh, upstreaming oil taxes uh, from uh, the oil property taxes that he proposed in, in 2019 to upstream from uh, the boroughs uh, up to uh, up to state government. That's worth about $400 million. Um, PCE making significant changes to power cost equalization to bring some of those revenues back into uh, back into the general fund. Um, he needs 21 plus 11 to uh, to do that. So there's there's two sets of numbers that I've really been concentrating on. Have a spread have a, have had an ongoing spreadsheet to look at uh, uh, through the election cycle. I think. Um, uh, and, 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 a, and a great tool to look at this election pending the, the, the additional ballots that, uh, that, that the Department of Elections is going to be, Division of Elections is going to be looking at today, a great tool to look at these issues, uh, was in Thursday's Midnight Sun, Matt Buxton's uh, Midnight Sun blog. At the bottom of Thursday's column, he, had a, he has a spreadsheet. Uh, that has a header on it, the margins for the close races. And it's a manipulable spreadsheet in the sense that you can, you know, reprioritize in several different ways um, uh, to, to look at the percent of the additional votes, the uncounted votes, the percent of additional votes uh, that need to fall a certain way in order to, uh, in order for an outcome to, uh, uh, to be, uh, to be, uh, 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 go go a different way. So, for example, you looking at the spreadsheet, you can look at the uh, Kevin McKinley, Adam Wool case. Uh, Adam has to get 58.12 uh, percent of the of the re- votes remaining to be counted to overcome uh, Kevin's lead in that race, and, and it's got it for the Nelson Franks, and it's got it for Hensley Tuck. 
Um, and and at the other end, it's got it for the the, the Rob Myers uh, uh, Marla Sanford race, Marna Sanford race. Uh, Marna would have to get 85 uh, percent of the vote. So using that spreadsheet, I've gone back to using Matt's spreadsheet. I've gone back to my spreadsheet and sort of, you know, made some judgments about who's going to win. I think the governor has succeeded in getting his 16. Okay. I I I think we 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 the governor's going to have. Uh, 16 in the legislature who are fairly rock ribbed, um, spending cuts oriented uh, to, to back up uh, fairly deep spending cuts. Now you lose, you're going to lose some at the margins depending upon where the spending cuts are. But but on my spreadsheet, I've got 20 in total who are fairly who are fairly supportive uh, of uh, of deep spending cuts. And so I think that's a I think that's a good sign for the governor in terms of in terms of trying to. Uh, be successful in, in setting up spending cuts. On the other hand, I don't have the, my, my, my spreadsheet doesn't yet have 19 or, or 21 confirmed in the house, uh, and 11 confirmed in the Senate for positive, uh, legislation in, in the house. I've got 19, uh, 19 that are, that are fairly in the, firm in the governor's camp, five that are still outstanding, like the Hensley tuck race, like the Bowers Sponholz race, um, uh, that could, if they broke the right way, could be supportive of the governor, could get over the 21. Uh, in the Senate, uh, <laughs> Senate is going to be very interesting. The Senate is going to be the, 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 the really uh, interesting body in, in this coming legislative cycle. Uh, I don't really have any uncalled races in the Senate. I've got nine who are with the governor, four who are sort of uh, ours, who are potential bipartisans. And seven Democrats. So I there, there's not 11 uh, over in the Senate. And, of course, you have to have both 21 in the House and 11 in the Senate. So um, good news is I think that um, the governor's got 16, uh, and I think that's going to give him some, some negotiating leverage uh, on other things. So, for example, he could go to legislators and say, I'm going to veto uh, the spending uh, in, in these certain areas. Uh, uh, and I've got 16 to back me up unless you uh, you come over to, to to my side on the PFD, in which event I may not veto as deeply. I think he's got I think he's got some trading bait uh, uh, that that he's going to be able to use. But it's uh, I think it's going to take that. It's not going to be clear that the governor can come in and say this is my agenda and it's going to pass. Uh, that he's got <clears throat> locked in 21 and 11 to pass. Uh, I, I think he's got enough leverage with this, with with having 16 up to 20 uh, to support the vetoes to be able to trade, but it's uh, he's going to have to trade some. Well, let's uh, let's dive into that for just a second to speculate. I mean, does he have the? And, and I don't I don't want to besmirch the governor here because again I support him, but does he have the acumen to do that? Because I mean, it, you know what we've seen. Thus far, especially last year, was a series of missteps, including opening up the call to a whole bunch of things, including reopening the thing to caving on the whole Wasilla deal and everything else. Does he have the acumen to use that leverage in the way that you just described in your estimation? Is that something that is even in his wheelhouse now, or is he just kind of treading water? No, I think he does. I, I, between Ben and... And uh, Ben Stevens, who's the chief of staff, and and others that he has uh, in the governor's office, I think he does have uh, that acumen. I'm not I'm not sure the the uh, the opening up in the call was a lack of acumen as much as it was sort of an intentional thing. But um, I think I think where where it's lacked in the, where it lacked in the last legislature is he didn't have a secure 16, uh, and I don't think at the end of the day he could really he he was comfortable. Were comfortable to could carry through on the threat uh, of of deep vetoes. There were too many uh, in the in the Republican majority uh, who were at the margin, who were ready to sort of cut and run on vetoes to really give him that leverage. And and I think what it takes, what 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 really is important is 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 having that 16 and being able to say with certainty, I'm going to veto down to this point. Uh, uh, we're going to be in the threes, three billion dollar range. I'm going to veto down to this point if you don't, if we don't, if we don't find a way to to deal on the PFD and, and on other issues. Um, I don't think he had that in the last legislature. I think he he 
it, it by my count, he does in this legislature. So uh, now whether he carries through on that, I guess is I, I guess will be a test of the governor. But uh, but I I think I think the votes I think the if you, if you rely on what people said during the campaign, the positions they took during the campaign, sometimes that's it's not perfectly reliable. But if you rely on that. Uh, I think he's got the 16. So I think that puts him in a puts him in a strong position. And and on the acumen, I think they do have the acumen to be able to to carry through on that. And I mean, I could spend a whole show just going into why I think you know I'm worried about just some of the actions. I mean, if you think that he intentionally opened up the call to allow them to overturn some of his vetoes, I have deeper questions for you on that as to why that that would make sense from his perspective. That, but. Uh, we still need to get into some of these other things. So final thoughts here on the 21 and 11 and the 16. What do you think looking at these numbers? I mean, some of these numbers, like you said, the Marner Sanford, uh, Bob, uh, Rob Meyer race. I mean, it would have to be 85. It would have to be 85% swinging towards the Dems. Uh, in other races, it's, it's, it's as little as 51%. So wh- how many of these seats do you think are going to turn over? I, I think I think we've got 19 uh, on the Republican side in the House, and I think we've got nine solid on the on the Republican side, the core Republican side uh, in the Senate. I don't think the Senate changes much. I think the Senate's going to be the way I've got it is is nine core Republicans, four potential bipartisans, and seven uh, Democrats. So I think the Senate's going to be Senate's going to be a, an issue. I don't I don't think any of these. Uh, final vote counts are going to make the Senate come out any differently, and you've got to have both houses to be able to to really pull the 21 plus 11. So the Senate's going to be a problem. The House, uh, the House, I've got 19 core Republicans, three potential bipartisans, 13 uh, 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 Democrats, with five races up in the air. Uh, those those races could break, you know, three, two, four, one for the Republicans, and you could have a fairly solid Republican House, but. But I think I think the the the, the conversations uh, and and the focus of what we're going to be talking about a lot during this spring is going to be over in the Senate because I, I I don't think the Senate's going to be a core Republican Senate uh, regardless of the outcome of the remaining races. Uh, you say I yeah, just curious. You think that the Senate won't change much? You think the Geyser Willikowski race is going to stay the same? Or I've actually you... got that flipped. Yeah. Uh, I yeah I think Willikowski is 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 You're... certainly within within enough. Uh, enough uh, uh, range to, to flip that. And, you know, taking Matt's, basically my rule of thumb on Matt's, uh, Matt Buxton's uh, chart was you know, if the incumbent was within um, uh, 55%, uh, then I think the incumbent's likely to win. If the incumbent's within 60%, I put that in the in the question mark. If the incumbent was down more than 60%, then I'd then I, you know, went with the with the person who was ahead in that race. Willikowski, what is that? Like fifty one or fifty two? Yeah, fifty one percent. Yeah, he's only got like a hundred and twenty votes or something between the two of them. So, yeah. yeah those so are- I, 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 I think that flips. Uh, but on the other hand, I mean, I, I don't think Marna gets eighty three percent or whatever that number is, eighty plus percent. Uh, and I think Rob's in uh, in great position. Uh, the Holland race. I think. I don't think they. I don't think. Uh, uh, the Democrat gets uh, gets enough uh, votes to overcome Holland's lead. So yeah, uh, well, it'll be interesting to watch. I am watching the McKinley Wool race for sure, uh, and I am watching the uh, uh, I'm watching the uh, Grier Hopkins and Kerber race as well. I think those are going to be close, and and the Hensley Tuck race. But there are a few. I think you're right that'll probably flip the. Uh, the Sponholtz race is close. Bauer Sponholtz, uh, it's at fifty-five percent, and uh, of course the uh, uh, the uh, uh, Largent, Lynette Largent, and the Matt Clayman race is just—I mean, it's seventy-seven votes. There's not much in between them. So let's just keep our fingers crossed that some of these districts break with what the state tradition is, which has been sixty, fifty-seven to sixty percent Democratic on the early votes in the primary. Let's hope that these districts fall a little bit differently. I don't just don't think that Dunleavy is in charge now, says Robbie. Um, which again, I I think he's in charge, but I, I'm just a little concerned about some of the actions that he took. And I mean, I asked if it was acumen, and it may be, maybe it's political posturing. Maybe Brad, you want to expand on that just a little bit. Uh, but I mean, I I could see no reason why he wanted to open up the call to potentially open him up to his own veto challenges. I I. 
I really scratch my head on that. Uh, and in fact, I had conversations with Donna Arduin about that, and 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 she was like, she was aghast that it happened. And I'm just curious as to why you think that that was an intentional. You know, what? Where's the where's the plus? Show me the money. Where's the where's the benefit on that? Oh, I, I think in in part it had to do with the recall effort. I think in part he was trying to. They were trying to. Uh, to some degree, uh, uh, de de energize uh, the recall effort. Uh, he didn't want to add the money back, but you know, allowing the legislature to to roll back some of the uh, vetoes was a uh, was 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 one way of allowing some pressure to uh, to to release off that. You know, and that's and that's going to be a that's going to be a countervailing pressure on him in exercising the power that 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 uh, that this election may give him. Um, you know, he may have 16 uh, and he may, you know, be able to, to be in a position to be able to exercise that. But, you know, it's possible he chooses not to do that because because of the potential for re-energizing the recall. So right, it's right. There, there's going to be a balance uh, in, uh, in 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 all this. I, 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 I think Alaskans sent a message uh, this election that they're ready to back up the governor. You've got James Kaufman, you've got Roger Holland, you've got Tom McKay, who, who really ran on nothing other than we'll be a governor, we'll be a, we'll be a vote for the governor. Um, and, and I think Alaskans sent a, a bunch of people, uh, are sending a bunch of people to the legislature who have said, we'll be a vote for the governor. Um, and, I, and I think he's got, I think they empowered him through that, through this election cycle, through kicking out Giesel and and Jennifer Johnston and Chuck Kopp and and others, I think I think the the Alaskans have voted to empower him to uh, to exercise those powers. Now, you know, if he doesn't do it, uh, we're going to have an interesting discussion in a couple of years in the governor's race. But but I, but I think they've given them the power to do it. Um, and I and I'm just not sure it was there last time. I'm just not sure he had he was comfortable. He had 16. I mean, you count on people like Sarah Rasmussen, and, and then you, and then they're not there when when you need them. I think he's got people who are going to be there when he wants them now. So it's a it's, it's a different dynamic that I think will give him uh, give him the power to do it. Uh, but again, you know, the recall and other things are going to be sitting out there, sort of pushing back on it. Right, right. Brad Keithley uh, is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. I, uh, you know, I think you're probably right. It probably was some kind of push. I mean, they that recall really had him running scared uh, uh, for, you know, he really pulled his horns in on a lot of things, including the defunding of the university and some other things that uh, that went went by. And, and I just, I'm looking for somebody who will say, if you're going to recall me, go ahead and recall me. But we've got to live within our means. I think that's the that's the biggest thing that I'm seeing out of all this. Yeah, and the problem with the recall is it's is is it it, it has no end date. I mean, that's that's the I I, I I really didn't believe that at the beginning, but you know, I read the Constitution, the statutes, and all that sort of stuff in it. So everybody who signed is is remains signed, and and they just have this incremental amount to go. Um, and they'll try to re-energize that if they if they think the governor is is going to veto a bunch of things, and it'll be it'll it'll be a pressure point. I again, you look at what Alaskans did this election. I mean, the Rob Myers. I mean, Rob Myers beat John Coghill, a uh, guy who was an institution up there, and he swamped Marna Sanford after everybody. I think everybody thought that that there was considerable doubt that he was going to be able to do that. I think Alaskans have said. By and large, Governor, we're we're sitting here. We're ready to go with you. So, right. um, I, I I I hope he does it. I, I think he's been given the tools to do it. I think uh, yeah. it's, it's not it's not going to be cost free though. I think he should. I think it should be encouraged by this election result. Greg asked the Stevens versus Madden race, and that is actually not laid out in the uh, Thursday um, edition of the Midnight Sun. Uh, that was an interesting race. I thought it was going to be closer than it was. Um, I think that uh, Gary Stevens has got that one uh, pretty sewed up. It would have to break pretty significantly towards uh, Greg uh, uh, Greg Madden's uh, side on that if that was to turn over, right, Brad? Yeah, that's a that's a higher than uh, higher than eighty percent uh, race. Uh, Matt sort of ran out of steam when he got into the eighties. 
he's only got three of them listed there, but but uh, that race turned out to be to be much higher. Yeah, so unfortunate because I think uh, Greg would have been a great uh, choice uh, in that race, but uh, kind of a hard nut to crack. All the Kodiak folks out there, they uh, they uh, it looked like it was going to be a pretty solid race, and it just just didn't uh, come on, uh, just didn't uh, come about the way we wanted in the end. Uh, Paul says, come on, Paul Bauer Jr., we need you to pull the vote out. I would agree. Paul Bauer is currently, uh, uh, where is he at? It's 55.83% versus Ivy Sponholtz. So that's right on the edge of uh, she will probably pull that out, but we'll have to see how it breaks specifically. That district, if I remember correctly, that district is historically blue anyway. And so it's probably going to be fairly heavily blue. Only 402 votes separate the two of them right now uh, on that right now. Yeah, that, as I say, I, 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 I counted anywhere where incumbent was anywhere within 55 percent. Was it within 55 that they only needed 55 percent of the vote uh, that the incumbent was likely to win? And that that race is 55.83. So it's right right on the line. Um, Paul, Paul ran a good race. Um, and part of it was. There was a libertarian candidate in there uh, that took away some of the vote that otherwise might have gone to Paul. So uh, he was running against a headwind there as well. Final thoughts as we watch this recount today. Um, just let you let you get the final say here. Well, I, I think we need to be we, we need to keep focused on the 16 and then we need to be encouraging the governor to use the power of that 16. That's that's really what this election is giving him. It's giving him 16 core Republicans, and I think the governor needs to focus, and people in, in talking to the governor, talking about the governor, need to focus on using the power of that 16. Um, all right, Brad, give us a quick tease for part two of our weekly top three. What is the next thing you want to be talking about, the PFD? Uh, there are some people who are talking about the permanent fund issue, going back to talking about the permanent, issue, permanent fund issue in much the same way that the the GCI talked about it in their in their 20, uh, 2015 and 2016 effort to uh, uh, to uh, to substantially change how the permanent fund uh, uh, is changed. I, the, to me, you've got to think about the permanent fund in in as two different issues, but but tied at the hip, joined at the hip, uh, and and one piece of the permanent fund issue uh, is not going to change without the other piece of the permanent fund issue. Um, and I think I, I think that's the way we need to be thinking about uh, the permanent fund as we as we go into uh, this legislative session. We bring Brad on because he uses big words a lot, including <laughs> things like intergenerational versus intragenerational equity. Uh, and uh, he wants to uh, kind of tie and talk to us and break it down for me, Brad. What are you talking about here when you you know people? Uh, people are talking about this; uh, these two different aspects of the PFD: intergenerational equity versus intragenerational equity. Tell us what you mean by that when you uh, are analyzing yeah, and, what's going and, on. And, and, and Twitter's a good a good tool to have to you know because intra intergenerational and intragenerational they use a lot of spaces. Right. <laughs> and so, so sometimes you have to come up with different ways of, of describing it. So there are two issues to the PFD when when people or two issues to the permanent fund when people talk about it. One is to intergenerational. They're talking about fairness between this generation and future generations. And that that really has resolved itself into a debate about uh, uh, overdrawing what some people call overdrawing the uh, the ERA or uh, excess draws from the ERA. And that and and that issue is really around do you do you take more than the POMV amount from the ERA? Um, uh, if you do that, as we've discussed on previous shows, you're reducing the investment base and you're reducing the returns, the earnings that future generations uh, will uh, will uh, 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 experience. So it's intergenerational in the sense that it's a question of whether this generation's treating itself better than future generations or whether you're treating future generations uh, better than this generation. It's really a question about how you're affecting future uh, generations. That's the intergenerational issue, and it's really showing up right now a lot uh, in the ERA debate about whether you have excess draws from the ERA. The second issue is the PFD, um, and that's intragenerational. It's a question about whether you're treating everybody within a given generation fairly, whether whether some in in a in a given generation are getting more, 
uh, and others getting less or whether you're treating everybody uh, fairly within that within that generation uh, uh, with respect to the permanent fund the treatment of permanent fund earnings and and that's really that's the PFD issue that is you know our PFD cuts are, are you making PFD cuts in order to help out the top 20 percent so they don't have to pay for government so you can shove the, the the burden mostly to middle and lower income Alaska families or are you paying a full PFD um, and uh, and and treating all Alaskans fairly all all income uh, levels in Alaska uh, equitably as uh, as Governor Hammond intended some people try to divide those two issues some people say well let's not worry and I, and I got into this debate last week with somebody uh, fairly hot and heavy some people say well let's not worry about the PFD let's put that let's put that on a shelf right now and let's focus on the intergenerational issue let's focus on making sure that that each generation takes its share but no more than its share uh, of the permanent fund earnings stream, and let's focus on making sure that that the SB 26 draws, the POMB draws, are set in stone and can't be violated. Let's fix that, and then we'll go with the PFD issue later. My response to that is the two are are, are absolutely tied together. Right. The reason is is this: if if you aren't treating the current generation fairly, if you don't have intragenerational equity, if you're trying to use PFD cuts to fund government and shove the burden on middle and lower income Alaska families, the the the, the knockback effect, the kickback effect is people are going to say, well, we need to take more from the permanent fund earnings right now uh, in order to make sure that everybody gets their share of the PFD. If you're not going to tax, if you're not going to cut spending, if you're not going to find some other way to deal with this other than other than PFD cuts, then we just need to take more of the permanent fund earnings to make sure that everybody gets everybody gets their share. In other words, you can't solve the intergenerational issue until you solve the intragenerational issue. And I just it, it I, we're going to see that we, we saw that with the GCI effort uh, in 25 2015 and 2016, where GCI said, let's lock in. Uh, uh, a share for every generation. Let's lock in uh, SB 26. Let's lock in the POMV, uh, and then we'll go worry about the PFD later. I, we 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 saw that during that period. I, we're seeing that. Ri I'm seeing that rise up again during this period. It's people saying we've got to preserve SB 26. We've got to preserve the POMV draw. Can't do anything else, but 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 limit the the earnings draw to that, and we'll deal with the PFD later. I you can't. I I just don't see how you resolve those two issues. It, to a, to a, to a degree, I'm really concerned about a led, this being part of a legislative strategy that we've talked about about before on the show, which is delay and kill. Give me what I want now. Uh, I know these two issues are tied together, but give me what I want now, and then we'll we'll get back to your issue, you know, next year once we've resolved my issue. Right. And what happens? What what invariably happens in my in my now 60 eight years of, of, well, a lot of the 68 years watching this stuff is when you get back to the thing that got deferred, it gets killed. So I, 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 I'm going to be, a, I'm going to be resistant. And I think others need to be, should be, and will be resistant to this effort to resolve the, the intergenerational issue, the, the excess draw issue, uh, and leave the PFD issue to another day. You got to get them both. You got to resolve them both until you resolve them both, until people feel they're being treated fairly on the intragenerational issue, on the distribution within this generation uh, of uh, of earnings. Until you resolve that issue, you're well, never going to get the intergenerational issue. That's resolved. the that's the tactic, right? Delay, 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 delay is deferred, is denied, which is dead. I mean, that's what happens. They delay it. And they just keep kicking the can down the road. It's got to be addressed. It's both got to be addressed right now. I want to get on to number three real quick. Um, you know, we don't know what's happening. It looks uh, very likely that Joe Biden is the winner in the race. I know that they've got some challenges and other things, but the chances are vanishingly small at this point that the president will be able to pull it out. And so that means a Biden presidency. And, of course, with all the rhetoric we heard in the last waning days of the campaign, Joe Biden is no fan of oil in any way, shape, or form, apparently. And what does that mean for Alaskan oil? Well, I think it's I think it's going to be more challenging times for Alaska. Uh, Conoco has has done a fairly good job of sort of locking in Willow. 
their willow development, uh, their 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 greater moose's tooth development is fairly far along. They've been a, they've done a fairly good job of of getting willow uh, far along. Uh, I don't see a lot of I don't see an effort by the administra- by a Biden administration to kill willow, but there'll be an effort to constrain it. I think it's going to show up in things like pika. Now pika is on state lands; it's not on federal lands, so you would think. That 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 peak is going to be is going to be sort of immune to this, but there's all sorts of federal permits that you need to be able to do a project uh, up on the North Slope, uh, and I think the Biden administration is going to be uh, very uh, uh, very hesitant to do that. There's one issue that I think Alaskans need to start thinking about uh, a lot that I think is a sales point of Alaska production. We we are a low carbon. Uh, uh, production uh, uh, area compared to the Permian, where you've got all that gas flaring going on. We're we're a very low carbon uh, production uh, area, and I think it's important for a, for us to start stressing uh, not only that we can do it safely and we can do it uh, uh, consistent with environmental standards, but that the output, the production uh, of what we're coming up with is low carbon uh, uh, for the for. Uh, 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 in, in content, and that's that's a that's going to be a I think going forward a strong sales point. I think we're probably headed toward a carbon tax uh, sometime uh, in the next uh, in the next four years, um, and I think a carbon tax is going to be is going to be frankly helpful to Alaska because it's going to penalize areas with high carbon. Uh, uh, content uh, in their in their production cycle, like the Permian Basin, like uh, like a lot of these fracking areas. Um, so I so I, I think there are advantages to Alaska. I think the Biden administration is going to is going to put a lot of pressure on additional Ala- additional development in Alaska. But I think Alaska has sales points that we need to start stressing and we need to start focusing on. And if they need some improvement, improving them uh, in order to in order to demonstrate that even with this new era that we're going into, a low carbon era, that Alaska production is still is still uh, uh, very competitive uh, in that regard as well. So we'll be watching this, of course, because we're, uh, you know, I think it's going to be at this point uh, inevitable that we're going to uh, see uh, uh, probably the Biden presidency is going to happen. I know people don't want to hear that, but I think statistically the numbers are there. And so we are going to be facing an uphill battle. But there are good uh, there are good opportunities here. So we'll uh, we'll continue to watch this and hopefully. We'll see it come out the other side. Carbon tax does nothing but give politicians money and degrade business. Goodbye, self-sustaining USA, says Paul. Um, which, I mean, in part is true, but at the same time, we, you know, if it's there, it will give us an advantage versus if it wasn't there. I mean, you know, in in that regard, if all if the playing field is equal in that regard. Yeah, I think I think it, one way or another, we're going to get back into a carbon tax. Europe. Has already started uh, going to, uh, 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 are, is, is starting down the road of a border tax based on carbon. Uh, there was a deal two weeks ago, an LNG deal where uh, there was going to be U.S. LNG sold into uh, a fairly long-term contract sold into Europe, uh, a French company, uh, and the French government stepped in and said, and and, and the LNG was going to be sourced out of the Permian, high carbon area. Um, and the French government stepped in and said no, thank you, uh, and, and blocked the deal. Um, and the deal has since fallen fallen apart. Uh, I think I think we're going to see uh, other parts of the world uh, introduce carbon steps that that is going to sort of back into the U.S. and and in a backhanded way uh, force us into a, into a carbon sensitive. Uh, environment uh, and 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 the best way to do that. I mean, Exxon and everybody and uh, all the oil companies agree the best way to do that is through a carbon tax. So uh, I think we're going to be backed into that, even if even if even if affirmatively we don't want to do it. I think the world is sort of going to force us into that. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Let me go back over here to see if there's anything else. Uh, Biden didn't win. Uh, could you just not cave like a cheap suit? I'm just I'm I'm not saying that he, you know, no, there's no official counts yet, Robbie. But again, statistically if you look at it, and I know there's been a lot of assertions of voter fraud and everything else, but there's up until this point there's no real proof. I'm not saying the president shouldn't exhaust every legal opportunity at his disposal. 
But I'm saying that if you look at it statistically, the likelihood is becoming smaller and smaller as each day goes by. So I don't, I mean, again, that doesn't mean that I, that's, that's what I want. It just means that I'm looking, I'm a realist. I'm trying to look at it and analyze from that perspective. You can't, you can't run a country on hopes and dreams. You know what I mean? You can't on wishes and fishes. You can't do that. Uh, and that's what we're looking at here. Um, we should have Brad discuss carbon taxes next week. The carbon tax will drive us to penalize us for gas vehicles down the road. They will control every aspect of our lives, uh, says Paul. Uh, Brad, you want to take that as a challenge for next week? Oh, uh, it's not a, it's not timely for next week. It will in the next year we will be talking about it a lot. Uh, there's much more going on at the legislature, I think, that we'll be talking about uh, next week. I, you know, a, a, again, carbon taxes are, are are is not just a a U.S. thing. It, it it is a global thing, and and a lot of our energy is exported. If we've got border taxes, border carbon taxes going on. Um, it's not going to be, it's not going to be long before we sort of back into that and do that, do that ourselves. We have to do it because everybody else is doing it kind of thing is what it comes down to. Uh, final thoughts here, Brad, as we let you go, we're about uh, 40 seconds out. Well, Michael, uh, I'm going to be looking at the election results like everybody else. I'm going to be seeing if the governor can get to 21 plus 11, uh, core Republicans. Uh, I think that's going to be, I think that's a possibility in the house. I don't think he's going to get to 11, uh, in the Senate. That means the real power the governor's going to have is in the 16. I think he's got that 16 locked in. And I think a lot of what we're going to be talking about from here on out is how he uses the power of the 16. All right. Well, I appreciate it. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thanks for coming on board, Brad. We appreciate it. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.